live from Earth, it's Space Radio. I'm Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Stony Brook University and the Flatiron Institute. And for the next half hour, your agent to the stars. We've got an exciting show for you today, for you today, where we are talking about the possibility of life on water worlds and how we might find it soon, which is super duper triple exciting. This show lives on listener questions we record every Thursday. 8 p.m. Eastern here at Spaceman Studios in New York City. So leave a voicemail to get yourself on the air. You can also follow along with our space cadets tuning in live from around the world, including but not limited to Pell City, Alabama, good old Seabus, Ohio, Johannesburg, Jayburg, South Africa, Ottawa, Canada, Tucson, Arizona, Washington, D.C., London, Canada, Vipava, Slovenia, we got Kosovo, we got Halifax, England tuning in, we got Cincinnati, Ohio, the Queen City, we've got London, UK, Sheffield, England, and more tuning in live right now. Go to spaceradioshow.com where you can get the links, and you better hurry because, folks, there are only four episodes left. That's right. We are now in the month of September, and this is going to be, this is the sunset we are at the twilight of the space radio saga. It has been a four-year journey, and what a journey. And let me tell you, folks, the cheese I've got tonight, I can smell it. It is a ripe one. It's a yummy one, and it's making me hungry. So let's get this science show going. Now, the news, I want to talk about the news. But to talk about the news, I have to use a certain word. There's a new jargon word. That has been proposed. It, it showed up in a research paper last week. The news caught wind of it. And we're all using it. And I read the word. And I'm going to describe what we're talking about. And don't worry. Don't worry. I read the word and I thought it had a certain pronunciation. And I was okay with that pronunciation. But then I read the origins of the word in the intended pronunciation of the word. And I, I felt violently upset and like sick to my stomach. So the word is spelled. So you, you catch what I'm making me so mad here. H-Y-C-E-A-N. We're talking about a new kind of planet, a potential a potential kind of habitable exoplanet, H-Y-C-E-A-N. Now, when I read it, I, I saw, saw it as Hycean. I was like, oh, that's cool. Uh, and I knew it had to do with water worlds, Hycean. I was like, is that Greek for ocean or water or something? I don't know. I, I, I don't think so, but must be Hycean. Hycean exoplanets. We're going to study Hycean worlds. They're Hycean aliens. This is going to be so cool. I know I'm being petty here, but I just can't help it. No, it's supposed to be pronounced Haishin. Haishin. Because H-Y-C-E-A-N is a portmanteau of hydrogen ocean. Haishin. Haishin worlds. Haishin water worlds. It sounds like I'm mispronouncing Haitian. And I'm talking about the country Haiti. It sounds like I'm saying that wrong. Did you hear about the 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 Haitian earthquake? This doesn't make any sense. This is horrible, but we gotta go with it. Or we can start a revolution. I can just keep saying Haitian. Here's but it's the science is pretty cool. Here's what here's what's going down. Sorry, I had to get that out of the way. With these um Haitian worlds, is we're looking for places, homes for potential life, right? And we want to find an Earth 2.0 because an Earth 2.0, we know that life started on the Earth because here we are. So if we find another co a copy of Earth, then there's a likely chance to find life. But of course, Mother Nature doesn't have to play by our rules and life could pop up anywhere. We, we And so we can broaden our search, just look for liquid water. Anywhere where there's liquid water, like the icy moons of the outer solar system might be homes for life because there's lots of liquid water there. And there's a proposed new category of planet that might be able to host liquid water. You start with a big planet, something uh, that we call a mini Neptune. So not as big as Neptune, but bigger than the Earth. And these planets can potentially have very, very thick hydrogen atmospheres. And if it's thick enough, like a thousand times the air pressure of the Earth, that pressure is able to keep liquid water liquid preventing it from evaporating and, and preventing it from freezing. So it can keep a lid on everything. 
And these mini Neptunes are, are everywhere. And yes, you're right. Sophia is saying people will pronounce it uh, like GIF or JIF, you know. Okay, so we can say, can we just say high seeing? The Quipper Belt, Kuiper Belt. I still say Kuiper Belt. And I know I'm getting on a discretion, digression here, Alien of Soul 3. The Kuiper Belt, I am aware that the word Kuiper is not the, the proper modern day pronunciation. Um, I don't want to get into it. I'm skipping it. I'm just skipping the whole Kuiper thing. Kuiper, Kuiper, Kipper. I'm not going there. <laughs> well, I know we don't pronounce ocean as ocean. <laughs> You're pretending to speak French, but you really don't. Uh, we must do, we must go to the ocean. No, I know, I know. Hi, Sean Worlds. Hi, Sean. I know, I know. Okay, just can I have my high C in here? <laughs> anyway, mini Neptunes, lots of hydrogen, liquid water. Mini Neptunes are pretty popular. They're pretty common exoplanets. We've seen a lot of them. And if if the, if the mixture is just right, if the size is just right, if the chemical co constituents are just right, you can have globe straddling oceans on these mini Neptunes that are kept in place by these very thick hydrogen atmospheres. And they can be in all sorts of orbits. They can be very close to the star, in which case the water is prevented from evaporating by the thick atmosphere. They can be far from the star, in which case the water is prevented from turning to ice by the incredible pressures. And so it all works out. And the advantage of Hycean is that, uh, Many Neptunes have these super thick atmospheres, and if we want to look for biosignatures, we need to study the atmospheres of exoplanets with something like the James Webb Space Telescope. And it's much easier to study the atmospheres of these mini Neptunes than it is Earth 2.0s because we haven't found any Earth 2.0s yet, and we have found a bunch of mini Neptunes. So the proposal is, hey, James JWC goes up, it launches, it doesn't blow up. It does its thing. It's going to study exoplanet atmospheres. Let's look at the nearest mini Neptunes. They might be Hycean, Hycean worlds. And then we might find biosignatures. So there you go. I mean, that's cool. That's cool. It's just my only beef is with the name. But yeah. Surprise, surprise. I have a minor nitpick about something. All right. That's enough ranting for tonight, right? I mean, no. There's always, there's always time for more ranting. And Nancy Graziano very, very graciously is copying some questions in the back channel. I'll do this. I'll do a couple of voicemails. What do we got? Campbell Duncan on Twitch is asking if the universe is filled with all sorts of fields, like the electromagnetic field, are there any other fields that we know of that we can send information on? Yes, yes, so uh, the field, this is so cool, and like no one knows this, and I wish more people knew it, because everyone's all obsessed with string theory. String theory is probably a non-starter, but that's a, that's a whole other episode. But we have quantum field theory, which in a lot of ways is even wackier than string theory and weirder. And it's a real physical theory, working theory of the universe, where uh, the primary object in our physical theories is not the particle, it's the field. Every kind of particle, like the electron, like the top quark, like the photon, is associated with a particular field. This field permeates all of space and time. And then it, it vibrates, it wiggles, it's so cool. And it sounds really weird and new agey, but it's accurate. And, and, and if you wiggle enough of the field in one place, that's what we see as a particle. And the field associated with the photon is the electromagnetic field. There are other fields associated with every other kind of particle. And these all soak the all of space time and they all interfere and work together and communicate with each other and then through all that mess we get physics yeah there are other fields there's a top quark field there's a neutrino field there are uh w and z boson fields all of these we can communicate we can use to send information we're used to sending information on electromagnetic fields, uh, electromagnetic waves, uh, but I could shoot electrons at you 
and you would get the picture pretty quick, probably that I'm relatively upset with you and I want to shoot you with electrons. But that's information. That counts. And so, yeah, any of the fields contain information. The gravitational field contains information. You can use it to send messages uh, because it's all just stuff flying around and you can encode information in all that stuff flying around. Uh, Zero Skull is asking a follow-up. So is there only one electron because it's a field, not the particle? Uh, this goes back, uh, Richard Feynman had this wacky idea. He had lots of wacky ideas, but he had one wacky idea that um, for every particle, there's only one of the particle. And what we see as the uh, all the electrons floating around the universe is the same electron wiggling back and forth in time, and we're just encountering it in different ways. Uh, he wasn't 100% serious about this. It's just a way of looking at something called Feynman diagrams, which is, again, another episode. Uh, no, 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 different particles are different particles. You have a particle over here, you have a particle over there. Those are different particles. They arise from the same quantum phenomenon, which is the electron field that permeates the universe. So there is one field, but it has multiple manifestations in the name of multiple particles. Mm, rumor mill, Procyon MFC on Twitch is saying that the SLS first test launch will be delayed to 2022. Any credence to that? Listen, I'm just hoping James Webb launches this fall, which I'm not holding my breath. And if it's delayed, I'm not going to be surprised. JWST has, has passed all tests. It's being shipped down uh, through the Panama Canal on its way to the launch site in French Guiana. It's, it's traveling from the through the ocean as we speak. But, and then the next like big milestone once J JWST goes up is this SLS, the Space Launch System, which... It's a rocket-powered boondoggle, in my opinion. It's a rocket that nobody wants. It's like, you know that phrase, like, generals are always fighting the last war. Like, you you, you, you defeat an enemy, enemy, and you come up with all this technology and tactics, and, and then you apply it to a new enemy, even if it doesn't make sense because it's all you know. This is like the last generation of rockets that's being used in the 21st century. It's huge. It's expensive. It's not going to be able to fly a lot. Yes, I'm sure at some point we'll have SLS launches. I don't think they're going to do much because so much of the space launch industry is moving over to the, the private companies. And they're able to do things so much faster. Say what you will about Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, and there's a lot to say. But SpaceX is also getting things done, and the SLS is not. So, yeah, I wouldn't... I'm. It, I believe that the rumors are credible, that the it is delayed until 2022. It stinks. Let's listen to a voicemail. Oh, we've got so many voicemails. I've been so bad about this. Don't worry. Uh, the last episode of Space Radio, which is going to be Thursday, September 23rd. Don't worry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch up on every single voicemail, I promise. So it's, it, it's going to be a marathon. It won't be a half-hour show. It will be... 45 minute show. It's going to be long. Oh no. And I haven't read, I haven't previewed any of these. Now, I mean, come on. There's a voicemail here from someone named Big Daddy Buttery. I'm not listening to that. I'm deleting that right now as I speak. I'm sorry. I don't know who you are. You may have had the world's most interesting question. Uh uh. Uh uh. Oh man, every time I, I inhale, I smell, I smell that cheese. It's a good one. Uh, okay, Lillian. Lillian might have a good question. Her voicemail is 12 seconds long. If she swears, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, okay? Just. All tattoo design, all good guesses, but wrong, of course. Tattoos, tattoo removal, tattoo madness, tattoo parlor was a popular one. So was tattoo shop and tattoo. I'm just deleting that one. Yep. This is why I get for not previewing it. Aaron, maybe Aaron has a good, has a good voice. <laughs> this is because usually it's, it's the ratio is about one out of three folks. When I go through the voicemails, I have to delete two other, because it's just a website and anyone can go on them and click the button and record. Ah, oh, gosh, here we go, Aaron. 
Hi, Paul. This is Aaron from Houston, Texas, and I have a question about terraforming Mars. So if I co recall correctly, in a previous podcast, you had mentioned something about the core of the planet being responsible for a magnetic field that protected the atmosphere from solar winds, but the planet's core cooled, thus taking away the magnetic field and leaving it vulnerable for the solar winds to eat away at the atmosphere. One of the possible solutions you had mentioned was... Uh, basically building a giant superconductor that would form a magnetic field around the planet. But as opposed to doing all that, could we theoretically just reignite the core? And if we did such a thing, would that produce a magnetic field around the planet again? Very good question, Aaron. The answer is no. Nope. If we want to protect the Martian atmosphere, if, if, we, if, we, if we start building a Martian atmosphere, it's going to be vulnerable to the solar wind. And if we don't build the atmosphere quickly enough, then it'll get stripped away faster than we can build it. We can never terraform the planet. So we have to protect it or build up the atmosphere ridiculously fast. And we don't know how to do that. So Aaron mentioned one proposal which is to build a giant superconducting ring around the equator of the planet. It's like, yeah, these are ideas, like good luck implementing them in the next century. Uh, it's not physically impossible, just like, oh, it turns out you need 10 asteroids worth of aluminum. And so that's like super easy. Uh, and run the superconductor, it generates a, a strong enough magnetic field and you can protect the atmosphere. Aaron wants to know if we can just reignite the core, like heat it up, get it spinning, doing something, no. Nope, 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 nope. That would take way too much energy. We don't even know how to get down to the core of a planet like that. We don't know how to dig that deep. Like, we tried. Have you been paying attention to good old Percy over here on Mars? And it had that little drill bit, and it, and it, and it broke. Oh, no, it wasn't Percy. Uh, who is the inside? The inside lander had the drill bit, and it broke like one foot down. It, it, we, we couldn't even get any samples. We, could, or we couldn't even get any readings out of it. We, we couldn't do it. Yes, I've watched the core. The core is one of the—I read the book first— the the book the core is one of i think three books that i have in the midst of reading thrown across the room in anger and disgust because usually i can just turn off my brain and it's a bunch of stupid science i don't care it's in another universe it's not this universe i'm not grading homework but the core was just the book was so bad halfway through i threw it against and yeah, that was brutal. And there was a book, I had an ebook and I didn't throw my phone across the room. I, I forget the ebook where I got one page in and it was so bad. I deleted it and I, and I wanted, I wanted my, my money back and I wanted to throw my phone, but I didn't because it's more expensive than a book. So yeah, the core is not going to help us here. And you can't, like, we don't know how to do it. Yeah, yes, in principle, in principle. And I always, any far out space idea, I always make the same point. It is not physically impossible to dig down into the core of Mars and like set off a bunch of nuclear bombs or whatever and reheat the core. But it's not feasible. It's not technically fe technologically feasible. It's not technologically feasible for any reasonable projection of our technological capabilities over the next one or 200 years. And that puts it in the realm of science fiction. Yes, we could do it. Our distant, distant descendants could, could reignite the core of Mars if they were so inclined. I think they might have better things to do with all their energy and time. But it's not going to happen soon. So we can't, so we can't say like, oh yeah, we just do it. Like, okay, I, when we're terraforming Mars, we just reignite the core. Like, wait a minute, there's a lot packed into that one sentence here. You can't, you can't, you can't skip that step. You need to show your work, all right? I am grading homework now. You can't just go right to the answer and say, there, terraform Mars. No, 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 Get some numbers here. I should watch Fast and Furious 9, the physics. Uh, yeah, I'd watch, I've, I've seen one or two of the Fast and Furioses. Um, or 
with whatever those are. I've seen a couple of them. Yeah, I just turn off. Easier to build the magnetic ring. Yes, Kent, that's the point. It's easier to build a superconducting ring around the entire equator of Mars than it is to ignite the core. Listen, you need to join the conversation or leave a voicemail uh, or join the live stream, the Space Cadets over on YouTube and Twitch. That's spaceradioshow.com for all the links. And remember, this show is brought to you by you as long as it lasts. I'm still doing other shows. I'm still doing Ask a Spaceman YouTube, Ask a Spaceman podcast. I'm doing some other adventures that I can't quite talk about yet because the ink is not dry. But don't worry, there is more stuff coming. Keep track of me on social media at Paul Matt Sutter. Also my website, pmsutter.com, for all those links to keep up to date with all my exciting projects. And there are more stuff coming, I promise. Uh, but but still, I do a lot of stuff for free. I just sit here and I record stuff about space in front of a camera, in front of a microphone, and I need your support to do it. It's patreon.com slash pmsutter. That's P-M-S-U-T-T-E-R. It keeps all of my outreach work going. Because if I only did stuff that I got paid for directly, I would, be, I would do a lot less stuff. Be like, you guys really do support uh, so much of my work, and I really do appreciate it. That's patreon.com slash PM Sutter. Now, let's go. Who else? Guys, what do you think? James Clayton? Do you think he has a, he has a good question? Do you think James Clayton has a good question? Let's find out. So is it true that um, we each get our own alien and others can try to steal them away from us, but we can always get them back? I'm, I'm just going to say yes. Moving on. What do you think? What do you think, guys? Anonymous. Oh, I'm nervous. I'm nervous about Anonymous here. Here we go. There you are. Oh. We're 10 seconds in. I speak now. Don't say we no reason to speak it. I can do a slam bag with no slam, but I'm do it. No speck it, no spot. I'm gonna do a book signing, but don't watch. If my face dance, no sign up, no shirt back. Cause I'm gonna do it, baby, don't get my shirt back. I ain't scraped up the dizzy. He ain't no scrape the dizzy. He ain't no scrape the dizzy. Do no bully didn't do when I sign this. Little loose it didn't do it, but don't shine it. My time is speaking. I can't shine it speaking. If I ain't step it speaking, off my book signing and be great. It will my crazy. Because they want to do it and then get paid with it. Like shiny things. If I grind these things. If I was trying to make spoon unicorn bones, it's just too cool. If you drink fish, don't drink no coffee with me. If I ain't big too sleepy. If I ain't big too do it. If I ain't black these lines up my leg, like don't big slap. There's probably been like 50 square words. I ain't big slap, they didn't do it. I don't know. Big slap, they didn't do it. They ain't like big slap, they didn't. They don't like big slap, they didn't. If I slap like these juice, I am a coin bitch. Do I need to play this backwards to understand? Yeah, can't like drip. Drip of my coin shop if it didn't coin King Marcus Kings. This is the life of a <laughs> This is the life of a YouTube like creator who says, Hey, you know, I've got a voicemail line, send me messages. I should have saved this for the finale because this is gold right here. This is what I get. This is what I get. Wow. Peter, please save us. 48 seconds long. Hi, Paul. Peter here. First off, let me say, when I find whoever has been robbing me to pay you, boy, is that guy in trouble. My question, though, has to do Peter with an infinite universe. If it is indeed the case that the cosmos is infinite in size... Was it also infinite just after the Big Bang, assuming there was a Big Bang? If so, how does that square with the sizes cosmologists have calculated for that time, like the size of a proton or a grain of sand, a softball, etc.? And if not, how and at what point did the universe transition from finite to infinite in size? Thank you, and I love the show. Thank you, Peter, for having a sane, rational, coherent question. 
in English <laughs> that I can understand. Uh, yeah, yeah. So anytime we mention the size of the universe, we talk about the observable patch of our universe, which is currently 90 billion light years across. So when we say, oh, yeah, when the universe was, uh, you know, one second old, it was the size of a peach. That's the observable universe, the current patch uh, that we can see 90 billion light years across. It was about the size of a peach. There, it's more universe beyond what we can see. It might be infinite. It might just be insanely large. If it is infinite, if it is infinite, you can still have a Big Bang because the Big Bang is characterized by infinite density. You just take... You, you take two points, it doesn't matter, two points in the universe, you have uh, marker A and marker B, you run the clock back, marker A and marker B get closer and closer and closer and closer together until they're right on top of each other, that is the Big Bang. It doesn't matter how big the universe is, what matters is the distance between points. So even if our universe is infinite, large, we can still have a Big Bang. And anytime we reference sizes of the universe, we're talking about our observable patch. You just heard my cheese board. I know there's more questions from the space cadets. Who, who we got here? Uh, Andrew coming. If the speed of light were infinite, would cosmic redshift still occur? Uh, yes. Because uh, the redshift, blue shift doesn't matter about the speed. It just changes the wavelengths, changes the energies. If a planet is a water world or a gas mini giant, then space, space exploration is hard. If it's large and rocky, then gravity will high in space, hard to reach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, don't worry, we're not visiting any of these exoplanets anytime soon. Guys, today, mm, lovely cheese. Two milks involved here. This is a product of Italy. We've got cow milk and sheep milk. This is a uh, Robiola bocina. Bocina is a little uh, commune, a little town in Italy, which I was reading the Wikipedia about Bocia. It's, it's not the present location. Apparently, 200 years ago, there was a flood. Or no, 400 years ago, there was a flood, and the village sank, and then they like moved over. But <laughs> in, the meanwhile, in the meantime, they made a lovely, lovely cheese. This is from the Casificio dell'Alta Langa, Robiola Bocina. Ah, molto bene. So I was reading the um, mm -hmm, the ingredients here in the cheese, and it's milk, milk, milk. Total fat percentage of this cheese. Are you ready, folks? And it it's a brick, like it's a heavy brick. A uh, fifty percent, fifty-seven percent fat. Fifty-seven. Fat. I'm, I'm eating a butter in the form of cheese. Robiola Bocino, unmistakable square shape, intense aroma, like I mentioned. Oh my gosh, this is so good. Soft, ripened cheese, delicate and smooth. The creamy heart reveals nice butter and hay flavors. Oh, wow. Well, it's tender and slightly moldy rind offers an herbaceous tang. There's that word tang again. Enjoy this spread on a toasted piece of rustic bread. As a satisfying snack. Yes, ma'am. Wow. This is a stanky cheese. Look at that creaminess. It is, it's not even folks. Look at that. That is a creamy, creamy, creamy center. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It is smooth. It's creamy. It's like, <sighs> you ever see a cow laying down as it's chewing its cud? It's like you're cuddling with that cow. And you're taking a nap and you're on a sunlit field in the Piedmont of Italy. You're on a hill. You're looking out over the field and you came up on this beautiful brown cow. You just cuddle up with it. You take a nap and the sheep comes. And the sheep comes and it's all cuddly and warm and it cuddles you. So you're cuddling the cow and the sheep is cuddling you. And that is Robia Lebusina. Thank you to my good friends at Dom's Cheese, D-O-M-S Cheese.com. 
for supporting this show for over a year and supplying all this amazing free cheese. Oh my gosh, they are so good. And they do more than cheese. They do so much cool stuff. They do a lot of locally sourced ingredients from New England. They ship. They ship everywhere. Call them up. Go on their website. They will send you some very, very nicely sourced cheese. Thank you so much, Space Again. Space Cadets, thank you for joining me on this voyage of Space Radio. Everything's falling off of my desk because this cheese is just overwhelming. I'm Paul Sutter. This show is brought to you by you. Please go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter to keep this show going and all my outreach work. Thank you to Vladimir Stepanov for the super chat. You can drop a super chat anytime you want in the YouTube chat. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Nancy Graziano, for producing the show, wrangling the space cadets. Catch the live stream three more times Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Visit spaceradioshow.com. And of course, thank you again, space cadets, for listening. See you next week. And remember, science is for sharing. And-